<laughs> I, um, I said I would um, tie up some loose ends in this final lecture, and these are the loose ends I'd like to say some words about. Firstly, you remember that the business of the change of twist of the plateau boundary on, uh, on a bounding wire uh, turned out to be ra of rather crucial importance, and I want to look at that a little more closely. Uh, secondly, how then does a plateau boundary, that's where a soap film meets a solid surface, how does it migrate? How can it move on that solid surface? Um, then I want to go on to the uh, question of reconnection, which has come up in ma various lectures at, at, at this school, and is obviously very important both in the biological and the, and the uh, physical science context. Uh, the reconnection of skewed of, of vortices, um, and I'll talk firstly about a, a, a simplified model of diffusive reconnection, and show you some results of that. And um, secondly, a model that is based on the Biot-Savart equation. I don't think that's an equation that has been put on the board as yet. But if you have a, a vorticity um, that is the curl of velocity field and that velocity field has zero divergence, then you can solve, in effect, for the velocity field that is induced by that vorticity, and it is um, a 1 over 4 pi times the integral, the volume integral, omega x prime vector product x minus x prime um, dv prime over mod x minus x prime cubed. This is the Biot-Savart law. And uh, that is exact, but if you have a concentrated vortex, whatever, um, with vorticity flux, a gamma, but concentrated on a curve, which is what we're often concerned with, like the vortices that you see in the Irvine experiment, for example, you see closed curves evolving and reconnecting, then um, that can be approximated by gamma. The flux of vorticity is like integrating this first across the cross-section of the curve, so it's a gamma over 4 pi, and then you're left with an integral around the curve of dx prime cross x minus x prime, and again the same denominator. <coughs> and that's the Biot-Savart law that is used a lot in the study of evolution of vortices, and uh, I'll use it uh, in the approach to singularity here. And then, insofar as time permits, I want to come back to this problem that I touched on at the beginning and intended to, in the first lecture, intended to cover, but haven't had time as yet, the universal dynamo process, which depends absolutely crucially on non-zero helicity in the background uh, velocity field. In other words, a non-zero degree of knottedness of the vortex lines of the flow. So that's the plan for today, and uh, I don't guarantee to get through it all. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that um, I have uh, upgraded these um, lecture notes, which have been, I think, uploaded to the web for the participants. Um, they were updated yesterday, and they're still evolving. <laughs> so um, I think there will be one more update, um, probably after the end of this um, summer school. Um, and at that stage, they can, they can, as it were, go live. But I just draw your attention. A lot of the detail of which I'm forced to, um, to omit in the lectures can, can, um, can be found in these, in these lecture notes. Um, well, um, just to, to focus on that uh, business of the plateau boundary and, and the wire, the plateau uh, and its intersection. Let's see here. Uh, have I got this? Are we switched on here? Not sure. Can someone uh, show me how? 
that's just a switch there, is it? <laughs> okay. Yeah, here we are. You can actually um, see the plateau boundary, that thin curve on the wire here, and it is just about to e evolve. I'll see if we can make that run. Uh, watch the movement of that. You see it? I don't know if you saw it. I'll play it again. Um, just watch that curve. Uh, let's see. On the boundary, there, quite something is going on at this point, and that is actually the moment of the sing singularity. It's expanded in this in this version here, I think, and should be clearer. Look at the boundary there. Now you see a you see a it winding round, and it comes to a critical point at which some kind of um, change of twist occurs. So I'll play that one once more. Um, oops, let's go back. Previous. Wrong one. Watch it there. There. That is the plateau boundary migrating on the surface of the wire. That wire has a, um, a diameter that is less than a, a millimeter, so it's, c it's considerably expanded in this uh, picture in, in order to show the movement of the, of the plateau boundary. And that's at the moment when the topology changes and when uh, the surface jumps from one-sided to two-sided and it happens all because of this change, well, associated with this change of twist on, 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 on the boundary. So uh, that whole thing was, uh, say, 300 frames per second. This slowed by a factor of 15. I think this one slowed by a factor of 30. So it's a fairly rapid process in practice. Um, and that plateau boundary had a right-handed twist before the jump and a left-handed twist after the jump when we analyze, when we look at that very, very closely. Okay. Now, uh, there was a question also about the migration of the plateau boundary on a solid surface. And I mentioned we'd done this experiment of taking a, a catenoidal soap film suspended between two circles and you can pull the circles apart beyond and you reach the critical at which the catenoid collapses or wants to collapse towards the axis. And uh, I showed you a movie of that process last time. But here's an experiment in which we place a solid cylinder in the, uh, and it can be either cent centered or, or off center. Um, and um, Actually, with this just uh, this just shows the off-centered situation. But we're here looking at it. Um, the cylinder is nearer to us than the than the than the central axis of this uh, system, and uh, this shows what actually happens. I'll show you these movies. But um, so when we 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 separate the two circles, this catenoid collapses and first hits the cylinder at a point here and here's where it hits and a, a small well it's a sing singular event of course but a, s a plateau boundary then expands from this point here and it expands and eventually meets itself as it were around the other side of the cylinder so you get a second singularity here and from that from that point on it um, you have two plateau boundaries which recede um, to the ends of the cylinder, giving you two disc, a two-disc solution. So that's what you may be able to see here. The plateau boundary is a little bit faint, and again, it's slowed down here by a factor of 25 here and by a factor of 50 here. <coughs> and um, this is what we've been doing quite uh, recently. Is this um, going to show? There it goes. So this one is... Well, I don't know if you see anything there. I'll try and stop it when the, right, the other one went as well. Let me try this one again, and I will try and. Uh, it didn't. It failed to stop. <laughs> I 
didn't quite click it right. Let me try again. There. So you see the, can, is that visible? I can see it on my screen. The plateau boundary, it's a faint curve on there. The cylinder is more or less dry. There's a dry patch here. The plateau boundary is fairly elliptical in shape and is expanding quite rapidly. We'll do it with the, um, with the lower one. And, uh, ah. Um, there it's hit on the one side, so there's a, a dry patch on the right of the cylinder, and from that point on the plateau boundary will spread round. Um, you can see it here, it's moved very rapidly, and, uh, and then we're into the final phase of two, and um, a little bit of um, a little bit of oscillation because of certain elasticity in the in the soap film. So that's what happens. Now you might ask immediately, well, what is the speed at which the plateau boundary actually moves on the solid surface? And that is in itself quite an interesting problem for fluid dynamics. And this is the sort of very crude estimate that fluid dynamicists make when they're faced with a problem that is really exceedingly difficult. This is the um, axisymmetric situation. Imagine the cylinder at the center of this on the axis of symmetry, and here we've got the stage when the plateau boundary is moving upwards towards the disc-shaped region. The parameters that matter are the surface tension of the film, sigma, the viscosity of the, uh, of the soap film, uh, mu, um, a parameter h, the scale of the plateau border, which remember is very small. It's where the plateau, the region where the plateau border intersects the solid surface. That scale comes into it. Now we've got the area. Area is of the soap film is proportional, energy is proportional to area. And the area is trying to minimize, obviously, so it's decreasing. The area is a function of the height, uh, I've called it capital Z, which is decreasing with time. Uh, Z is increasing, the area is decreasing. So A is a function of Z with A prime Z negative. The rate of change of energy, well, energy is sigma times A, so it's sigma dA by dz, dz by dt. And dz by dt is the velocity that we're trying to find. Um, so that's the rate of change of the film em energy. Well, we can estimate A prime of z very roughly. I've estimated it here as being... Um, 0 0.3, uh, well, a prime z, negative, so it's minus 0 0.3 times pi a. It's the dimensions are uh, obviously dimensions of length. It's uh, length squared divided by length here. So length, and this is a, a, f a reasonable estimate of the, um, of the prefactor. Um, so then we have dE by, with this estimate, dE by dt minus 0.3 pi a, uh, sigma a times u of t. Now that's got to be equated to the rate of dissipation of energy by viscosity because the film is dragging along this solid surface. That can be estimated as, um, so this rate of dissipation of energy by viscosity. It's got viscosity here, mu. It's got a rate of strain squared. That's u divided by the scale in which everything is happening. Squared. And then it's got the volume. We've got to integrate over the volume over which it's happening. Well, there's a 2 pi, um, 2 pi, uh, where is it? 2 pi, 2 pi delta. Delta is, I'm sorry, delta is the radius of this cylinder. So some, somewhat less than radius A of the uh, two wires. Um, so there's a 2 pi delta, and then there's an H squared for the, to get the volume of the plateau border region. So we've got that estimate for the rate of viscous dissipation. We equate these two. Right. Energy decreases because of dissipation. And that gives an estimate for the speed. You um, going like surface tension, obviously it goes faster if surface tension is increased. 
it's impeded by viscosity, so it's sigma over mu, and then there's a factor A over delta, A divided by delta, the um, radius of the, the cylinder. If that cylinder is very, very uh, small radius, then um, uh, this speed is increased because the region in which viscous dissipation operates is decreased. Yeah. Sorry? H. Uh, yeah, H, this H here. It Well, it disappears in the, um, actually it cancels out. It doesn't matter. It's not sensitive to the answer. There's a one over H squared and there's an H squared. It is, um, it is an unknown. It's the scale of um, the region. Here's the, Here's the the, sil the solid cylinder, and here is the <coughs> the film, which um, uh, it's coming the other way, different curvature like that. The catenoid it expands a little bit here, and the scale of this region is the h. It's small, a small length scale, but whatever it is, it doesn't seem to matter because in this estimate, at any rate. Uh, as I say, there's a cancellation, which is very fortunate. Yeah. Well, that um, A prime, <laughs> the A by the Z, what do we do? It's, uh, suppose I take it like this and think of what is delta A. We take the the A um, A at the beginning, or A at the end, here's a cylinder, and so we know what the area is at the end of the process. And uh, at the beginning of the process when Z was equal to zero, when you're down at the center plane here, you've got um, a, a, a catenoid again. So we can estimate the area of the catenoid initially and finally. And then over the delta Z, well, delta Z is just the, the height B, uh, which is two-thirds A when it's uh, approximately two-thirds A when, when, when you're at the critical um, separation at which collapse occurs. That's uh, true, yeah, yeah, that's true true, you'd get a formula in involving the dA by dz, yes. Um, that is true. <coughs> okay, so um, that's all. We that This is work in progress. Uh, we're, um, Ray Goldstein right now, I think, is, uh, is improving on this experiment in order to actually measure, get, get good measurements of the, um, of the speed. Um, for uh, one thing, one can easily vary is the r uh, radius of the cylinder delta, obviously, and see if, at least, if this uh, formula holds. <coughs> um, of course, that 0 0.15 it may turn out to be rather different. Okay, um, now the next thing is the um, business of diffusive reconnection of Burgers of Berger's vortices. And that's a rather special type of vortex, very well known in the fluid mechanics literature. But you have a vortex and you s subject it to a, s it, it wants to diffuse by viscosity, but you subject it to a strain, straining flow that uh, opposes the diffusion and there is a steady state uh, resulting uh, with a Gaussian profile and it's known as the Berger's vortex. So we thought, well, let's take two of these vortices with a straining field that is pushing pushing them together and pulling out in the other direction. So you get the positive strain acting on both vortices. So they're both um, uh, like Berger's vortices, evolving slowly but being pushed together. And um, on that basis, um, uh, this is where these uh, these pictures came from. The the solution involves uh, the angle, the angle between them, which goes to zero, because they become anti-parallel. Um, the angle is beta, tan beta is actually e to the minus three alpha t, where alpha is the strain rate, times an initial, tan beta zero. 
So you can see beta is going to go to zero quite rapidly according to that equation. Then there's a parameter s, which is a function of that beta. And tau is a dimensionless time. And the vorticity field is given explicitly in this um, model. It's an oversimplified model. But uh, here it is. It's given in terms of a, function, a scalar function, chi, um, which I've written. You don't worry about the detail, but it's explicitly uh, given in terms of um, position x, y, and z, and the time tau. Um, and there is an error function associated with the Gaussian character of this flow. And on the basis of that uh, solution, one can compute <coughs> the modulus of omega to get a single scalar and plot contours of the modulus of omega. And that's what these contours are. And they show the bridging effect that I mentioned before. Um, but whether you see that bridge or not depends on the level of the contours that you decide to plot. And if you use very low levels of the contour, you'll always see that bridge. Um, there is, for example, the picture when the contour levels are not chosen so low and you don't see the bridge, although you might say it's the beginning of a bridge, but uh, change the, the contour levels and the, the bridge is, is certainly there. And uh, one thing we were really interested in with this investigation, which was published a couple of years ago, was um, what happens to the helices when you have two vortices like this. If you look at it from here, you see one crossing. So it's a writhe of um, I I one, if you like, which contributes to the helicity of the flow. Each vortex, you might say, induces a velocity parallel to the other vortex, a component parallel. And that, again, is a uh, an indication of uh, the helicity of the flow. But it, it comes out, if you want, if you prefer, as, as the writhe initially. Well, it turned out uh, that in this process, partly because they're becoming anti-parallel and then destroying each other, that the writhe helicity is in fact destroyed in this process during this diffusive reconnection. And it's not replaced by twist helicity. We can calculate the whole thing. It's this is These are the curves of uh, the helicity as a function of the par time parameter. And um, if the vortices start rather far apart, then that helicity remains constant until they begin to interact significantly when they get begin to overlap with each other. And at that stage, the helicity falls to zero. So the writhe of the um, vortices, if you like, the, the net writhe uh, falls to zero. Um, if they start close together, then that process starts immediately. Um, well, that wasn't a very good um, model because it actually neglected the vortex-vortex interaction. It was a linearized model. It said we've only got them driven together by, by um, straining field. Like, um, I mean, it applies better to magnetic flux tubes than to vortex tubes. And really, the in more interest attaches to the vortex tube situation. So... Um, We've more recently been looking at uh, the Bio-Savar model in which we take account of a whole, not just a skewed vortices, but we join them up um, to make um, a figure of eight with one crossing, which is obviously contributing writhe at the initial instant. Um, but in order to analyze this, we use the Bio-Savar evolution as indicated over here. So. Um, we take the velocity, given this, now we can par parametrize easily enough a figure of eight and um, work out the resulting velocity field from a single integral round, round the curve of this kind. So given the vorticity, we know what the velocity is. And that velocity then deforms the vortex, this uh, figure of eight. And the deformation is greatest where they are nearly nearly in contact. There's a minimum separation here. We've called it dm minimum, the minimum separation. Um, and I'm sorry that is so uh, faint, but it says that dm squared um, goes to zero at a critical time. It goes linearly to zero. And the critical time is 0 0.330772. Well, it's going to zero in this way. Eventually, it, uh, the linear relationship 
br fails. But the reason for that is that uh, we have to discretize this um, by little finite elements in or order to uh, compute the Biot-Savart integral. So this is discretized with um, uh, 32,000 little segments, um, 2 to the power 15. And um, if you increase the number of segments, then you can uh, continue down this curve further. It certainly looks as if it's heading for uh, uh, a finite time singularity. However, the Biot-Savart model uh, fails to take account of the distortion of the vortex core. You see, it treats the vortex as just a delta function, a line curve, concentrated vorticity. In real life, any vortex has a finite radius. It has a, a structure. And when the two come together, that finite structure is actually flattened considerably. Instead of a tube, you begin to get a sheet. Um, and that is well known. So th this um, does not hold for a, a classical vortex. It's a tendency, and this is what is known as Leray scaling. It goes back to Leray in the 1930s. Um, it's Leray scaling, but um, it does break down uh, before the singularity is reached. However, it may be uh, uh, this sort of model is, is probably better for quantized vortices in liquid helium that attract a lot of attention uh, because there the, um, the vortex structure does remain almost like a delta function. It's quantized, it's down at the Planck scale or whatever. And um, I think the, the Biot-Savart model uh, is rather better. Well, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we, um, yes, yes, sure. We assume we have a vortex with that shape. Oh, right. Uh -huh. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, but that'd be nice to see how well and how it compares the sort of thing you've done with other things, how it compares with bio, bio savar evolution. The LIA is something that should be said that, um, again, it's a further approximation of the um, Euler equation um, which uh, has been frequently used and um, is, is a very useful starting point for many studies, but it has a weakness, and that is that vortex lines are not stretched under. They remain constant length. In fact, every element has constant length. And um, that actually is not the case as soon as you look at um, Biosavar here. Uh, I'll show you the, the, the little movies here. Well, it's like movies. Um, uh, these are the skewed vortices, and this is the velocity distribution on this vortex due to, well, due to the whole thing, due to the other vortex and its self-induced um, velocity um, that is causing it to move along its, uh, its binormal, in fact. Um <coughs> so the whole thing is included in this sort of picture. Um, skewed vortices and the arrows show the velocity on each vortex. Well, I've said induced, it's mainly induced by the, by the other vortex. And um, we can see how that evolves in time. Um, so let me just, um, I don't know how we get it to go. Uh, oops, oh, uh, play, going back to this again. Yeah, I can do it. I can speed this up. It's desperately slow to begin with. But if I speed it up artificially, you'll see what happens. You see, they're now getting very close together. You see the deformation of the vortices at this stage and how the velocity increases. The velocity actually goes up like 1 over t as well as you approach the singularity. And there we're getting very near the singularity. And there we're at the singularity. And uh, that's rather remarkable. You see, something very dramatic is uh, is happening uh, when these vortices want to touch each other. This is the same thing seen from a different projection. Um, okay, we'll do it here, seen sideways on. 
They, they don't seem to be deforming that much, but um, they're getting closer, and that's what's causing the large increase in velocity. Look at that. You'd almost say they have reconnected at this point, but um, that's perhaps just wishful thinking because the model's bound to break down before they actually touch. However, it shows you the tendency towards the singularity which initiates the process of uh, reconnection. Um, okay, um, I think uh, that's the last uh, slide there, so I can close down this operation. Take to the blackboard for the last bit, and I uh, have to rush this a little bit. Um, but the details are given in these notes, um, which you can find online if you want to follow up any of the details of what I'm about to say. It's about the universal dynamo process. And I say we expect helicity to be rather crucial. And it, um, the method that is used is a method known as mean field mean field electrodynamics and it dates back to Steinbeck et al 1966 the approach that was introduced in a very famous paper published in Astronomy Nachrichten they were in uh, Potsdam of course at that era and um, contact with uh, with the DDR wasn't all that easy but I did visit um, uh, Krauss and Radler the collaborators in this wor famous work in uh, 1973 and had a very very interesting involvement with them there um, well you remember this is based on two two length scales so let me just draw the picture in a random manner think of that as a velocity field having a length scale which is quite small you might say it's something like the mean radius of curvature of the streamlines and then we focus on the evolution of a magnetic field which is somehow averaged um, over that small length scale and will look something like that it's non-uniform. I'm going to call that B0 of X and T. And that's on a length scale, capital L. Again, could be radius, mean radius of curvature of that large field. So L is large compared with L. And that separation of scales is the uh, crucial crucial starting point for mean field electrodynamics. And we suppose that we have a velocity field which is random. Function of position and time. But its average is, we'll take it to be equal to, it doesn't have to be, but um, we'll take the simplest possible situation. It has zero mean, as much as I've drawn it, as much forward as backwards as it were. And um, Okay, uh, random, and the average, what does it mean? It's an average, average over the scale L. That means we sort of think of taking a box, a box that's large enough to contain a lot of eddies, but still small compared with the, the blue curve. So you're in the intermediate scale, and you can average over that and still get... Uh, variables like B0 that uh, vary on the larger scale. Now you can formalize this with per small parameters, epsilon and so on, but I won't do that. It's uh, physically clear what one is doing. So that's the average over a scale L. And you take the equation that should by now be familiar. Remember that was the lead derivative and we have a diffusion term. And the whole point of dynamo theory is to devise or to understand situations in which the churning up of the field more than compensates for the natural tendency to 
diffusive decay associated with that term. That's what we want. So we obviously average this equation uh, up. We average the equation. Oh, and let, let's, uh, we, we decompose B into B zero xt plus a perturbation B, where the average of the perturbation is equal to zero, and this then is the, the mean field. B zero xt is the average of B, averaged over that small scale. It's very natural. So we can average the equation. The B zero by dt is then equal to, now this is a quadratic term, and uh, so we better include a contribution. It's usually written like that, a uh, curly E plus, and the average of this one is del squared B zero, where E is the average of U cross B, the average of fluctuating quantities. Because the average of u cross b0 will be 0 because the average of u is 0. So all that survives is the average of fluctuating quantities. And then we subtract this equation from the original equation to get an equation for the fluctuation. And that is the curl of u cross b0 plus, now there's what is often described as the pain in the neck term, and I'll write it simply as curl of F plus eta del squared B, where F, the pain in the neck term, is U cross B minus average of U cross B. And we've done nothing there. We've just uh, separated out the mean and the, and the fluctuation. Okay, then... Um, This equation, you see, if I think of u as given, then this equation is going to establish a linear relationship between the fluctuation and the mean. So we get a linear relation. u, now b, is linearly related to b0. I'm going to say if, provided we regard u is, I'll say, given for a given velocity. Uh, now, it might not be given in detail. If it's a turbulent field, then you prescribe the statistics, all the statistics of the velocity field. So that's what I mean by given. But b is linearly related to b0, and therefore also u cross B average is linear, same thing, because it's still linear in uh, with U given. So E, well what is the linear relationship between two vectors? EI alpha IJ B0J plus beta IJK DB0J by DXK plus and so on. Um, now, the scale, remember, of the B0 field is large, so the gradient is small, and the next higher gradient will be even smaller, and so on. So this is actually a series, series in powers of L over L, this small parameter, powers of. So presumably rapidly convergent. And um, attention is usually focused on just these first two terms. Now, simplest case. Simplest case is that in which the turbulence is isotropic. Invariant under rotations. And um, these parameters, the tensor coefficients, alpha and beta are properties just of the turbulence. They don't involve the magnetic field because we've taken out that linearity already. So they can only depend on the statistics of the turbulence 
and on the parameter eta, which appears in solving the equation for b, supposing you can solve this equation. Um, well, isotropic turbulence means these properties of the turbulence have to be isotropic tensors. So alpha delta ij, beta ijk is beta epsilon ijk. And you could go on if you wanted with higher order terms, but we usually don't. And in that case, this becomes very simple. E is alpha B0 minus, actually minus, beta times the curl of B0, that curl coming from, from the epsilon, the epsilon. Um, now, something uh, you have to notice immediately about this expansion, B is a pseudo vector. It's like, like, like vorticity, right? It's got a sort of sense of ro rotation to it. Um, e, on the other hand, electromotive force is a pure vector, pure um, like velocity. So the coefficient here has got to be a pseudo scalar. Pseudo scalar. However, when you get to the next term, you've got the curl here, you've got the pseudo bit here. So this beta is a pure scalar. You know what I mean by pure scalar, like mass or temperature. Uh, four. There are only four possibilities here. <laughs> um, Okay, so then the equation for the mean field has to become very simple. dB0 by dt equals alpha times the curl of B0 <coughs> plus, and actually the beta comes in as sort of additive. It's a curl, curl B0 in that term with a minus sign. That's, um, that's plus del squared B0 for the beta term. So that's where that appears. So it's clear what beta is. It augments the natural diffusivity. There's no proof that beta must be positive. But there, and there are examples of very curious flows for which beta is negative. But generally speaking, beta is positive. You expect positive beta, the chewing up by turbulence of a magnetic field is going to augment the natural chewing up due to molecular processes. So um, this is called turbulent. The whole thing is uh, turbulent diffusivity. But what is important is this term here, and that is entirely novel or at least it was in the 1960s, but it's revolutionized the, our understanding of uh, dynamo theory. <coughs> you see, if I take a let B, B0, satisfy, I'll take a particular structure, curl B0 equals K times B0, where K is small, capital K is small. For example, you know, say, well, what sort of field is that? B0 equals some constant times sine, well, let me make it sine K Z cos K Z zero. If you work out the curl of that, <coughs> the curl with a D by D Z, blah, 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 it's K times B0. In other words, it's what we describe as a circularly polarized field. If you take a field that's in this direction here, you move along, you move along the z-axis, then it rotates. Circularly polarized field satisfies this condition. Well, if it satisfies that, then we can do it twice and get del squared. Well, obviously, del squared B0 is minus K squared B0. And the equation becomes 
db0 by dt equals alpha k minus, I'm going to call that eta effective, k squared b0. This is eta effective, the sum of the two eta e. So this um, gives you exponential growth. B0 goes like e to the pt, p alpha k minus eta e k squared. Now you might say, well, alpha alpha is a pseudo scalar. It might be positive or negative. Well, if it's negative, we choose k to be negative as well. So alpha k is positive. If alpha is positive, we choose k to be positive. So there's always a mode there for sufficiently small k, and that means sufficiently large length scale L, capital L. See, that this k is now, k, let's say, is of order L to the minus 1, and L is large. So k is small, and if k is very small, then this term dominates. It's the leading term of the equation that dominates, and you get exponential growth. So now all we need to do is to show that, to, to find out what is alpha exactly. What is alpha? Well, of course, um, the fact that it's a pseudo-scalar immediately makes you think of helicity. Surely it should be related to helicity. Can we uh, prove that? Well, um, we can. If I take, by way of example, example, u, a coefficient, and I'll take the same sort of thing, sine kz, kz. Uh, let me put a comma there, and uh, cos kz, and put a comma there, and close this here. You might say, why am I writing it like this? Well, we um, want to sort of symmetrize this with res make it isotropic, or as near isotropic as we can. So if I have sine kz, let's use cyclic permutation, and put sine kx here, and let's put sine ky here. And then we've got cos kz, so I'll put cos kx here and plus cos ky here. This is a special example of what's known as the ABC flow in fluid mechanics. And it's got a certain, it's got cubic symmetry. See, if you cyclically permute x, y, z and the components, you're, you're left with the same thing. And it satisfies omega is the curl of u. Well, do the curl operation, and you'll find that it is just equal to k times u. It's like this. It's, um, it's a flow of maximal helicity. The helicity is uh, omega dot u average, which is k times u squared average. And uh, actually, you don't need the average because um, it turns out the omega dot u is is um, uniform. Um, however, I put in the average because that's how helicity is defined. And that is equal to k. Um, there are three, three contributions. Uh, three k times u zero squared is the helicity for this flow. Now we can solve the equation for the perturbation. The only difficulty is this term. Well, I'm going to neglect this term. Neglect. We can't solve it exactly. It's difficult. And there are all sorts of theories trying to push this theory further. Um, but um, neglecting that term is like neglect. It's what's known as the Born approximation in quantum and wave mechanics. Um, and so it's uh, frequently used and uh, remark it's successful, more successful than it deserves to be in a way. 
but let to me uh, neglect it. And then this term here is uh, also approximate, more or less uh, B0 dot grad U. Because the grad U is quite large, you see, that's on the small scale. Whereas other contributions are small. That's dominant. So we're balancing that and that. And we can very easily invert a Laplacian. And we can work out B0 dot grad U. Now to calculate alpha, this um, relationship between E and, uh, which has vanished, no, there it is. E. This has got to be true for all magnetic fields, B0. So we can take, to calculate alpha, just treat B0 as a constant. So take B0 to be a constant field. 0, 0, B0. Constant. That should be enough to calculate alpha. If we wanted to calculate beta, we'd have to take a B0 with a constant gradient. And that you can do. But we want alpha. So take that, and then we're solving eta del squared B equals minus B0 du by dz. That's coming from the B dot grad on the other side of the equation. B0 du by dz, well, minus B0 du by dz. There's a contribution from here, which is k cos, kz. And there's a contribution from here, which is minus k sine kz. And there's no other contribution. That's because I chose this particular direction for the B0. You can choose any direction, actually. You'll end up with the same result. So we can uh, invert the Laplacian, remove eta del squared. Well, that's uh, minus eta k squared B for this, um, for this space dependence. So we can get B immediately, then construct U cross B and average it, and I'll just tell you what the answer is because the time is hence. It leads to alpha equals minus 1 over 3 eta k squared times the helicity. And you have to put it in terms of the helicity because if it's a pseudoscalar on the left, it's got to be a pseudoscalar on the right as well. So it's the only sort of self-consistent way to write this thing. So here we have an example of a flow, and you can do it for much more general, for any, any random velocity field. You do it for a random velocity field, the result, the analogous result, is that alpha equals, mi it's almost the minus 1 over 3 eta, and it's an integral 1 over k squared under the integral sign, and then a h hat k dk where h hat of k is what's called the helicity spectrum function. Spectrum. Spectrum function. Rather like energy spectrum, but it's when you have a turbulent velocity. In order to have helicity, it's got to lack reflection symmetry. It's isotropic. It's like that box of screws that you shake up with the random directions of the screws, all with right-handed thread. That's what gives you a, a ve vector field with, um, that's not reflectionally symmetric. So there you have it. You have exponential growth if the k is um, small enough in magnitude, um, and provided alpha is non-zero. And even weak helicity will do. We've got maximal helicity in this particular example. It seems very special velocity field. But suppose you had uh, it mixed up with all sorts of reflectionally symmetric terms as well. So you end up with a rather weak helicity. Well, it doesn't matter. If we put an epsilon in here, we weaken this effect. Well, all right, we, uh, we, still, get, we still get growth um, provided uh, k is small enough. 
you maybe have to go to a larger scale. Well, we've got the whole universe to play with. So you need just a little bit of helicity in the turbulent flow in the whole intergalactic medium and the magnetic field will grow gener generically. And that's what I mean by um, the universal dynamo process. And if we look out there in the and the further you look, the more magnetic field you see. It tends to get weaker, of course, when you have a very, very, very large scale. And like on the galactic scale, it's a much weaker field than you have on the sun. But that's, a ma again, a matter of scale. I mean, if you take the galactic field and squeeze it down to the dimensions of the sun, you get a far bigger field than, the, than, the, than you find in the sun. Um, so I, I think this is... Um, this is amazing theory. It's all so simple, um, and yet it explains so much. So perhaps on that note, I can uh, terminate these lectures. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>